So we've had some glimpses into the climate crisis and a little bit into the ocean crisis and now the soil crisis. So now I'll present you with a fire crisis. And hopefully they'll have alcohol at that cafe tonight. <laughs> um, okay, so how do I advance this? Seriously though, I'm gonna talk about climate and human impacts on biomass burning during past millennia. Um, let me just see. Okay, I'd like to start by thanking um, Kathy for inviting me, the organizers, and thank you all for being here in this morning. And um, this work is very much a community effort, as Kathy mentioned. Um, the Global Paleo Fire Working Group has evolved over the past couple of years, and we've um, been putting together sedimentary charcoal records to reconstruct biomass burning um, since the last glacial maximum, about 21,000 years ago. And so these records have been collected from hundreds of places around the world, lakes, bogs, marine environments, and so forth. Um, and before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge our funders. And how, does, how do I advance it? Just this? Okay, that's simple. <laughs> um, so fire occurs in almost all terrestrial ecosystems and it's relatively frequent in about a, a third of the land surface. And its effects are incredibly complex because they vary over multiple temporal and spatial scales. The effects are good um, as far as we judge them and bad in, in many cases, so it's mixed. Um, there are complex interactions between the biosphere, the uh, um, atmosphere and the human sphere, if you can call it that, or social, social sphere. Um, and of course today there are uh, documented increases in wildfire activity in terms of fire frequency, severity, duration, longer fire seasons on multiple continents um, around the world. And this has been linked to global warming and so this is obviously a concern today. And the paleo record of fire is important because it can provide a foundation for understanding some of these complex interactions on long time scales, giving us baseline information and particularly helping us understand the controls on fire. So here you're looking at um, different ways to reconstruct fire history, which is how we get our information about fire and uh, the pointer isn't. How do I do the pointer? Oh, this pointer, okay, I see. Okay, so this is this um, spatial coverage, goes from local scales to the global scale here, and temporal coverage for different methods of fire history reconstruction range from days to geological epochs. And so there are basically three different ways we can reconstruct fire history. We have satellite and historical records, which are observations go back, you know, maybe 30 years for satellite data. Um, historical records go back maybe a century. Tree ring da data goes back a few hundred years generally, um, and it's in this inter intermediate spatial scale. And then we have good information from paleo records, but they tend to be generally local uh, fire histories. Uh, and so the work that I and the GPWG is focused on has been trying to fill in this, um, this part here, which has been a real gap in our knowledge. We haven't had good broad scale long-term information about fire. Um, and today, with fire changing all around the world at the, in, in similar fashion, we're very interested in getting this long-term broad-scale information. And so I'm gonna talk about meta-analyses of these charcoal records. So just very quickly here, I'm assuming you all um, know a lot about sediment cores. So um, fire, uh, charcoal from burned vegetation on the landscape either during or after a fire gets blown and washed into lakes. It accumulates in the sediment. Um, we take sediment cores and just, just tally the abundance of charcoal through time, construct our chronologies, and then um, infer biomass burning, or in some cases you can actually infer changes in fire frequency if you have good high resolution records. So this is an inventory map of the global charcoal database, and this is available publicly now, the first version of it. This um, inventory map is from the second version, which is now in process, and you can see this is definitely a community effort here. The data set was published in this paper um, by Power et al. in Climate Dynamics last year, and you can see we have pretty good coverage um, in, in certain areas, North America, South America, and so forth, and some obvious gaps, but in general, we do have global coverage. 
And these are all the data um, behind that inventory map. And I feel like there should be a drum roll here, but <laughs> there, um, this, this plot doesn't really do justice to the data set because uh, there are just lots of gray dots. And it you know, took someone probably a year or more to just collect a few of these samples there. Um, you're looking at 200,000 years ago to present, and the scale's a little bit funky. It goes 200,000 to 20,000, and then 20,000 to present. And um, this, uh, the charcoal quantity varies over 12 orders of magnitude. And so this is basically just um, showing you how noisy the data are and that, that there are lots of different ways that charcoal can be processed and analyzed and quantified. And so just looking at all the data together in the database um, is not very productive this way. And, and so you have to standardize it to make any sense of it at all. And so that's what this is showing. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but basically it's an example from Signet Lake in Yellowstone National Park, and the record, um, each record goes through four different standardization steps. So we normalize the data, transform the data, um, and, and make it comparable to other records. And so uh, this is from that climate dynamics paper, and this shows us the sort of grand summary of all those well, 405 records in this case. Um, the black line here is the one of interest. It's changes in global biomass burning during the past 21,000 years. And we can see right away this is um, a little bit different than what was presented earlier. We have very low biomass burning during the glacial period, increasing during deglaciation, and then relatively um, higher and more stable levels of biomass burning during the Holocene. Um, and this, uh, however, masks a, a tremendous amount of spatial and regional variability in burning around the world. Um, the CO2 record from Taylor Dome is shown just simply as sort of a proxy for climate conditions in general. And so you can see that um, uh, this is very much driven by climate changes. And there was a paper by uh, Fisher et al. in, um, I think it was science last year also, that suggested that this line here was actually straight. And their data was based on ice cores and um, a modeling, combined ice core modeling approach. And so the paleo data here stand in direct contrast to that. So that was an important finding from here. And also I should just say that this, we didn't know this at all. We didn't really know that this trend existed. This was all new. So it was pretty exciting to see this. Um, and what I want to do today is talk in detail about um, changes right here during uh, the Younger Dryas in particular. And then I'll talk about changes during the last 2,000 years. So this first study um, came out in PNAS, Wildfire Response to Abrupt Climate Change in North America. And so what we wanted to do, since we're seeing increasing fire activity in many different places in response to global warming right now, we wanted to see, well, is there ever any evidence in the paleo record that fire responded to um, climate change at these broad spatial scales? in the past. So um, I dug up all the records from the database that I could find that, had, that were recording fire activity um, from 15,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, that sort of deglacial period. And there were 35 records um, to look at, mostly in Western North America. But then there was another motivation for this paper. And um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the recent comet hypothesis, which suggested that um, a comet impact, uh, where the, there's lots of different kinds of evidence from this black mat layer found at archaeological sites um, for this, this comet impact. But it's a very controversial theory, as many of you know. And so one of the major, um, one of the major implications is that this comet hit or exploded above the Laurentide ice sheet and sent this atomic blast across North America, burning all the vegetation, essentially, and therefore destroying the food base of the megafauna, contributing to the megafaunal extinctions, and also contributing to the decline of Paleo-Indian populations. And so continental scale burning, um, which is what they argue, would certainly show up in the Paleo fire record, we figured, and so uh, wanted to look for that. So this graph is a little bit overwhelming, but I'll walk you through it. We just stacked up the 35 different charcoal records from lakes. And I should say that most of these lakes are in fairly remote locations. Many of them are high elevation. So you wouldn't expect human influences 
on these um, records in most cases. But what you have here is time is running from 15,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, same here, 15 to 10K. And the blue line here is the beginning of the Younger Dryas, um, and the red line is the end of the Younger Dryas interval. And you can see right away that there are a few sites that show significant peaks um, at the beginning of the Younger Dryas and during the hypothesized comet impact. Uh, but in fact, what you also see is that there are actually more uh, sites showing a large peak at the end of the Younger dry Dryas interval when we know that there was an abrupt warming. So one of the first things that's, that's clear is that it's certainly the case that not all sites were burning um, at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. And so we don't have any evidence for a continental scale um, fire event or burning all across the continent. That's clear right away from looking at the data, these data anyway. And the other thing is that there are fires occurring all, all over the place, really. But if anything unusual happened, it's that it happened at the end of the Younger Dryas when we had abrupt warming. So just to kind of clarify this, the blue is, um, there were only three sites to show a, showing a peak within 50 years of the beginning of the Younger Dryas interval, and there were many more showing a peak at the end. And then some sites showing a peak at both the beginning and the end, which is also consistent with the idea that you might get increased fire during any rapid climate change. So if you merge or essentially average those 35 records and look at a summary of biomass burning in North America during this interval, you get this black line here. And the main trend in it is, is simply an increase, a pretty large increase in biomass burning, but it, it naturally breaks out into three intervals before the Younger Dryas during the bowling Alarud, where um, climate was a lot warmer than previous, and so you have increasing biomass burning. During the Younger Dryas interval, the cold, um, relatively cold climate conditions associated with a leveling off of fire activity, and then the increase in burning resumes after the Younger Dryas when climate conditions are warming again. And so this again, like the long-term LGM to present summary, is showing a tight relationship between climate and fire in general. And not only between general climate conditions and general levels of fire activity, but we also see um, an increase in biomass burning here as sort of a discrete peak and an increase in fire frequency here that occurs during the abrupt warming event. Um, so, okay, so we have a relationship not just between long-term sort of gradual changes in climate, um, but also this abrupt change in climate, especially increasing temperatures or climate warming climate conditions associated with increasing fire. So this second study that I want to talk about is focusing just on the past 2,000 years. And this study uh, was inspired in part by this, um, the old sort of hockey stick curve of northern hemisphere temperatures over the past 1,000 years. This figure is actually 10 years old now. Um, and so what we were thinking, based on our sort of crude analysis of the uh, data set in the beginning that I showed you, we saw a slight trend over the past um, thousand or two thousand years, and so we wondered, considering the impacts of population on fire and um, what we assume to be the relationship between people and fire, that people generally cause fires, we know that today, we wondered if, if we summarized all the charcoal data for the past two thousand years, would we get this sort of hockey stick um, shape, this long-term decline and then this exponential rise at the end. And so what we find is that we don't get a hockey stick at all. We get a garden hoe. We, we, we get this long-term decline and then an abrupt rise starting about 1750 and then a nosedive in the last century or so. And the dash line here is, is it's dashed basically because we have fewer records to support that downturn. But that downturn is very robust in different regions. It occurs almost everywhere except for in the high latitudes. Um, so, in order to explain this, um, as complex as fire is, um, the potential controls on, on global biomass burning are fairly simple. It can either be climate or humans, and there aren't really many other things that can explain sort of broad-scale broad trends in burning. So what this is, 
So the curve I just showed you is, is duplicated here, and this is the same curve here, and we're looking at 2,000 years ago to present. This is AD now. And so we collected the climate data, best available climate data, and then um, best available data on population and land cover change from the Hyde database, and here's CO2 from ice core records. And you can see pretty clearly that uh, the best correlation here is between northern hemisphere temperatures and biomass burning, whereas uh, you can't really explain a long-term decline in fire by gradually increasing population changes. We wouldn't expect to see that. And so we see similarity not just in the long-term decline, but also in some of these um, shorter-term centennial scale wiggles here. When temperatures increase, we see a bump in fire activity. When it declines, we see a decrease in fire activity. Um, but where this where this charcoal climate relationship breaks down is really at 1750 AD. At that point, temperatures are fairly flat, but biomass burning is starting to really skyrocket there. And so we need to turn to the population data at that point uh, and in order to explain what's going on here. And so this is just a stylized view of our interpretation of the trends. We have long-term cooling um, associated with a decrease in fire activity and then this rapid rise is occurring at 1750 AD when, of course, we know European colonization and settlement was associated with massive land clearance, the conversion of forest to agricultural land, uh, and lots of burning for a variety of different reasons. At 1900, it peaks and then starts declining. And at that point, most of the forests have been, or many of the forested lands have been converted to agricultural lands, and so we've essentially replaced uh, uh, we've essentially re replaced fire with tractors and herbicides and pesticides and um, fire, direct fire suppression as well. So I'll just wrap it up with lessons learned here. Climate drives fire on long time scales, centennial to millennial scales, it's very clear. Past episodes of abrupt warming are associated with increases in fire activity and human activities appeared to have radically altered global fire regimes since 1750 AD. We don't see any evidence that humans had a global impact on fire prior to that. And then paleo data are important for testing models. And I should just say actually that back here uh, in the modeling community, sometimes fire is basically just scaled up to generate emissions. It's scaled up from population estimates. So population is used um, to predict emissions, and you can't do that. There isn't a sort of natural linear relationship because the relationship between people and fire seems to sort of have a threshold here, and so it, it isn't a linear relationship. So that's the paleo data are important for testing models conclusion. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, my, my question might be a little naive, but that pattern of land clearance and biomass burning would, does it suggest it's driven heavily by, heavily by um, North American trends? Or you know, Northern Hemisphere? Uh, North America and US, or is that a? Um, in, in terms of, uh, well, I think the, the impacts were definitely localized. I don't, I don't think that North America is necessarily driving the, the whole pattern. Uh, we haven't really explored what, uh, what land use changes in particular have caused this, but we do see similar patterns in different regions, um, and certainly pe places were colonized at different time periods, and so there's a lot of variability in that timing. Um, and one of the things we're starting to do now is break out into the different regions to see what's happening. But we do find that the patterns in burning, at least, are very robust um, in, from region to region in terms of, uh, in the sense that they support this sort of general trend. The, the uptick and then the down, the down, or the nosedive in burning over the last 250 years or so. That sort of pattern appears in many different places around the world.